Good morning, everyone. I guess we'll get started. Um, I'm Shah Osha. This is the final lecture for the art lecture series for fall quarter. And we are excited to have Nancy Huang in from New York with us this morning. Um, I just wanted to thank the people that really helped make this happen, who uh, coordinate with me. So um, Raul Berman, uh, Dave Crampton, Julie Ron, media interns um, from Electronic Media, this, these, um, and Evergreen for supporting this. Without them, this would be a much, a much more difficult pursuit. So thank you all. Um, and for, to introduce Nancy, we have Jasmine Brodnex here. So she will be introducing Nancy. Good day, fellow students and faculty of Evergreen State College. Good day, Nancy Huang. I'm delighted to introduce you as the speaker of this week's art lecture series. Nancy Huang is an artist that includes the audience in her projects, allowing for spontaneity of the human ingenuity to really involve itself within the artist's realm. As a multifaceted artist that not only invites the public to actively participate, Ho Wang is definitely a community resilience advocate. They not only are initiating conversation and awareness through visual and auditory mediums, they sometimes deliver scripted performances, including everyday real life settings and tools. But they are also filming and editing these pieces to evolve the greater imperative of the piece. In Impromptu, an earlier work from 2005, Huang is quoted saying of an associate, I think he's just talking about his whole struggles. I don't think he's trying to preach it. A common theme I found in her works. I am more than excited to introduce soul-born New York-based Nancy Huang. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's kind of, um, that's kind of like joggled my head just just because I, whenever I do something, I kind of just forget about it and put it in the past. Um, um, I just want to thank everybody that Shaw thanked because I have actually been working with them and um, everyone's been really amazing. Um, and I actually think this is uh, such an amazing opportunity um, for me. Um, I feel like this is maybe one of my projects where it's really not about me at all, but it's actually about meeting all of you that are participating. I always think about um, who is across from me, who is next to me and what their experiences have been to lead them to a place where we're actually converging. Um, I, you might not like me, I might not like you, but um, I think we, we have things to clean from one another in our short time on this planet. Um, and that's actually the gist of uh, what my work is. Um, um, let's see, today is November 17th, 2021. Um, and I wanted to, uh, to share, um, instead of showing my past projects and talking about them and explaining them, them. Um, I don't know how interesting that is and how that enables us to connect. Um, I'm more interested in like jumping right in and, and opening up a conversation with um, one or more of you who might want to jump in. Um, Shaw said to me the other day, and I think other people have said this to me as well, is that there doesn't seem to be a big difference between my art practice and my life practice or my life. Um, they, they are indeed, I feel like they're one and the same. Um, it's just um, like anybody else, what you're thinking about all the time, um, what, you, what you see on the street, what you see on, on the internet and how you're reacting to that and what you're thinking about in your environment. Um, whether it's like things that are happening in your own life, your friend's lives, your family's life, all those things kind of affect the way we're looking at things. Um, so let me see if I can share some 
of my personal photos with you. And um, it's, it's unedited photos. Um, and um, I'm just gonna flip through them. And if anybody's interested in an image and wants to say something, they can. Um, but before that happens, let me, let me see. So while you're looking, Nancy, I just wanted uh -huh. to um, tell people how they can uh, contribute to the conversation and jump okay. in. So okay. if you raise your hand uh, at the bottom, that would be the preferred um, way to get our attention. And then we would ask you to, if you are willing to unmic yourself, but also um, share your open your camera and and join us on screen so that we're not speaking into the void i think that in terms of the interrelational that will be very helpful so if you raise your hand um to join the discussion then we'll we'll make it possible for you to turn your camera on and to speak if that is too much we can also um take chat q a and or just voice so we have those options. Okay, thank you for explaining. Um, okay, actually, I think I want to I want to talk about something that happened last week first, and then I'll talk about an art project I did a month ago. I will talk about one art project, and then I'll start showing my photos. So um, I think this is taken from a cap, and I saw this um, on an intersection somewhere, and I just really like the sign. Uh, don't be afraid of anyone. Okay, right, that's good, right? Um, don't, don't be afraid of anyone, but I'm afraid a lot of people. Um, I, I try not to be, but uh, last Sunday I was coming home um, from an artist talk. I don't do a lot of art things, but I, I was coming home from an artist talk and um, a man entered our subway car and he was extremely intimidating. He was big and loud and commanded everyone's attention. And he went um, individual to individual in the car um, with a whole spiel asking for money. He accosted, um, he started with some elderly people and there was a middle-aged person um, that he hadn't reached yet. And he tapped him on the show, shoulder and gave him a folded bill. And I think his intent was, please leave those people alone, here's money, move on. Um, but he proceeded to just keep doing that to everyone. And when he got to the person who gave him the money, he's doing the spiel again. And everybody was just silent. And this guy was catty corner from me. And I said, dude, Leave him alone. It doesn't work like that. He just gave you money. And he looked at me, cracked a smile and said, oh, I don't remember. Um, I'm probably smoking too much weed. I said, that's not good. But I don't know what um, provoked me to have this conversation with him. But I don't know. My, I, I work on my instincts. Like I think a lot of people do when you're walking or driving or riding a bike you know, you see danger, you do something to prevent it. Um, and I, I felt like this guy was maybe going to get hurt. Um, so the good thing that happened was nothing happened. Um, he, he skipped me, which was great. And he proceeded to move on to everyone else in the car. Um, but I came home and thought about that for a really long time. Um, I don't think he was homeless. He had a really uh, nice Adidas track suit on with pretty new sneakers, unless he beat somebody up and took them. I think he was doing okay. Um, so that's something I've been thinking about. And I don't know if it, anybody has any thoughts on that, but maybe we can come back to that. Um, let's see. Okay. And there's a question just in the chat. Somebody wanted, they missed when your, the incidents incident on the train happened? This was a Sunday night. It was the day of the marathon. So it was, the, was it the 10th? No, no, no. It was just this past weekend. Yeah. So it was Sunday evening or um, early evening coming, coming from Brooklyn to Manhattan. 
Okay, so um, so exactly a month ago, um, October 17th, this is odd. I feel like this is the wrong sequence. Let me see. Okay. Okay. Um, this is Saturday, the day before. These are my friends, um, Heidi and Michael, they're chefs. And this is my kitchen still uh, under renovation. But they came, we had gone grocery shopping um, and we had, we were preparing food um, to make a nice luncheon for women that are uh, living in a, a, a hotel that's become a homeless shelter or um, it's become a women's shelter specifically during the pandemic. So they've actually become my neighbors. Um, and Midori Yamamura, she's um, working on an exhibition with a lot of artists um, and they're trying to address this issue of homelessness. Um, and I thought, how the hell do you do that with art? I mean, it's such a heavy topic. Um, so I just decided, um, just I just thought, okay, really good friends who are chefs, let's just make a nice meal. What would I want? Um, oh, this is weird. Um, so it, a lot of work went into preparing this, um, but um, it was such a simple gesture. Um, but I had to first approach women across the street from me and ask them if they would actually want to have a meal in a park outside. Um, there's a park in our neighborhood called Madison Square Park. It is in walking distance and there are other people outside um, having birthday parties. Um, you can just kind of blend right in. I always thought about the park is there and, and it's been a respite for a lot of people. Um, it's helped me a lot during the pandemic. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a public park. It's there for people to um, utilize. But um, it's, I always think about who is, who is, um, who falls under the definition of public, who's allowed to use these spaces and who are not, who's not. Um, a lot of restaurants have opened for um, outdoor dining. Um, and we're actually in, in the streets now, the tables are in the streets um, and people get upset if somebody who has, hasn't had a shower in like a week or two comes walking by us and just hanging out, it's ruining your out, outdoor dinner. So whose space um, is being encroached on it? All these kinds of um, issues that I think about, but um, put all of that stuff aside. I just thought, what would, what, what does anybody want is, is um, just like normal things. And um, the strangest thing that happened was that, um, I, this part isn't strange. They were actually a little bit um, protected and hesitant when they saw me um, asking them if they would want to come to a lunch. Um, but I, I, they warmed up to me and um, we had about 10 women come. And, and the thing that, that I, we were debating whether to use real plates, and real flatware, I'm so glad that we decided to do that. They said um, the whole time they've been at the shelter, they're not allowed to have things like that. They're not even allowed to have plastic knives. Um, so it, immediately when they saw how we had set up in the park for them, they, um, they all hugged us and we just let them enjoy the time together, um, just talking to each other. And, you know, we didn't force them to talk to us about whatever, um, how they find, found themselves at the shelter or anything like that. And they were all, there were people of different ages, different backgrounds, and they were all incredibly great. Um, and you can see sometimes they're not all um, physically or mentally always in a good, in, in good shape. Um, but it was a really simple gesture, it just um, was one thing, but it was, um, it's something that I am still processing. Um, so that's a project I did recently. Hmm. Hello. There you are. Great, okay. Hi. I'm also Korean from Seoul. Can you hear me? Yes. I am, I am very moved by you, and I'm just wondering 
how you define artist. Wow, um, I th I think I I think you can define it any way you want. It's it's almost like I mean it's it's something I call myself. I have no problem calling myself that. And the great thing about doing that is it actually gives you license to do a lot of things. I mean, you can break the law and just say, I did it as an art thing and maybe get away with it if you're really <laughs> nice and smiley. I don't know, not every single time. But um, it's. I think everybody wears different hats at different times and different situations. But when I put my artist hat on, I sort of do feel a little bit like, um, okay, superhero, I can, um, I can do things, and it's it's a it's a psychological trick for myself. Um, but you know, some I think people who view art and view artists can define decide for themselves if they consider that art or if they consider that person an artist. I mean, I can define myself. You can define yourself based on okay. I'm Hee Soon Jun, and that's who I am. And you can define yourself. And I think artist is just another name, if that makes sense. Okay, I, I, then I have another question. Then how do you define art? Art, for me, is something, um, there's good art and there's bad art. But um, I think art is something that actually makes you look or makes you listen, makes you think, whether it's something you agree with or not. Um, if you if you go into a traditional gallery or museum space um, and a work is not calling you, um, then it's for for that viewer, it's that piece has failed. And to me, I you know that person might not consider it art at least at that given moment, whatever state of mind that they were in. Um, yeah, I I don't know. I don't want to keep ranting. Thank you. Thank you. Does that does that help? I don't yes, know. Yes. Yes. Thank okay. you. Okay. I actually want to uh, talk to Paul because you turned your camera on. Um, so you asked since 9-11, I have wondered if I am the kind of person who might run toward the danger to help people or run away to protect myself. I don't know how to logically figure that out. Is this something you have asked yourself? And if so, how did you get to a conclusion? Was your standing up to that large person an answer to this question? Um, I, I don't know what, um, I don't think anything was premeditated on my part, but I think all the experiences that I've had in my life up until that point um, made me react the way that I did. I think it's, it's not, always cerebral, but it was, I could not say anything. Mm. I, I, I don't know, it's, I do think that we all had some sort of survival instinct, but I felt, I felt that this, this guy was maybe gonna be in trouble. And I just, I just need to, needed to disrupt that, I think, thinking about it in hindsight. Thank you, yes, I'm, we'll, I, May happen to me someday, but we'll see what happens. I'll let you know. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Someone else um, said that they were robbed this past Monday by a man in Adidas and in Adidas track pants in November on November eighth at work. It's the outfit. I who okay? How many people? in this audience, in this group, right? Owns Adidas track pants, right? Ooh, a bunch of people. <laughs> um, and then there's one question here about, it looks like you didn't photograph the participants or didn't show the photographs. Was that for ethical reasons? Actually, my friend did, we did, they actually did want to take photos with us. As soon as they got there, they took, uh, photos of the setting and of one another um, and us together. Um, but um, it's, I don't know, it's just my personal thing. I didn't want to exploit um, these um, diners, these 
they're just regular people. I didn't want to exploit them in any way. Um, and I did. I never thought the idea of, oh, I did this project as an artist and here, here you know, I, I didn't want to make them a spectacle and I wanted them to give, I wanted to give them what I would want is just like um, humanity, respect, dignity, all that kind of stuff. And I don't think that they need to be in, I don't know, I don't need to flash their photos everywhere. If that makes sense. So um, can you tell me about how you felt after you got robbed? Okay, so um, I mean, I'm still kind of like processing and going through it. And, uh, you know, it was really crazy, but I, I feel like um, it put like a creative block on me for a while. And I'm taking two media classes right now. Um, but I'm just curious about like, you know, you experiencing this, um, and how did it, how did you work through it while also continuing to be creatively expressive? Do you feel like it interfered with your creative expression and how did you work through that? Um, after the subway incident? Yeah. I mean, nothing happened to me. I think it would have been different if something happened to me. Were you by yourself when you got robbed? No, I was, it was in the store. I was, I was working uh -huh. and, uh, within the store, but um, it was like my, my safety place. You know, I really enjoy being uh -huh. young. Um, but for my job, I'm also a social media manager. So I do a lot of work with like media and things like that. And so I'm creatively expressive at work. However, I feel like I ran into a block after I wasn't even the one specifically a part of the incident as well. I was just like, a bystander watching it happen. I wasn't the one actually putting money in a bag, but you know, I just wonder. So it was a, it wasn't like a, it wasn't a pickpocketing incident. It was like somebody. There was confrontation, and it was yes. put the money in the bag, or something's gonna happen. Right. Right. Yeah. But I'm wondering how you would work the through creative blocks. I guess. Um. I mean, I, I think it's different for everybody, but I, it, it's kind of, um, it's, I think it's kind of interesting that we're converging now where like, I'm talking about this random event and you're, we're finding a way to connect with it and we're through, through it and discuss it. And it's, is it something that you want to address um, in, in your creative work or not? You know, I mean, you, you can you can use it as a tool, actually, because now you have subject matter. I mean, that sounds ridiculous, but um, you, you know, it's like this idea of everyone has their own narrative. Um, you know, everybody that's um, participating in this right now, we're all going to leave and everyone's going to have a different interpretation of it and a different uh, recollection of it and what they take away from it. Um, so it, it's, you can, you can actually take that and, and rewrite it if you want. I think, I mean, I think an artist is supposed to be, um, what did they say? This is stuff I learned in junior high school, you know, is, is the trickster. It's like Prometheus who stole fire from the gods, right? So, um, you know, it's like, I think life always, in, and it's artists, it's basically, it's problem solving. Day to day, every day you're making decisions and it's actually problem solving. And how are you gonna solve this problem? How are you gonna take a negative experience that happened to you and turn it into something else? Mm -hmm. Metamorphosize. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Interesting, right. thank you. Thanks. Oh, you're good. You're looking at the chats and the Q and A's, right? So you got people thinking about this whole question of what art is. And I just wanted uh -huh. to say in response to Hassoon, like, you know, listening to you, watching you do this right now, this is your work in, in a lot of ways. And um, 
that and I usually when I introduce people for this series, it's it's people that have devoted their lives to paying attention to something. That I would say is partly what makes art. I mean, it's this thing that you said about what you look at, some, some, they, the artist points to something that you would look at to think about, but also the, the work that you do, what makes it, makes you an artist or what makes art has something to do with having devoted quite a bit of time to practicing, mm -hmm. returning to it in its futility, whatever, but that there is, a, yeah, that, that re repetition. So um, we have a question from Jordan. Jordan, do you want to join us and ask it? I'd need you to raise your hand if that was of your desire. Sure, yeah. I was just <clears throat> kind of thinking. Uh, it was more a response to uh, the last person that talked, but um, just with the subject of what is art and then also the... I guess, experience of being robbed or, or anything like that. And uh, Nancy kind of said it similarly, but just like the idea of taking those feelings that you feel like are blocking you and actually using them as your um, stepping stone to um, create a piece of art to like free yourself of that. So um, I guess I don't necessarily have a question, but maybe if you just wanted to speak on that. Um, I have friends who, um, who are art therapists, but I know when I was an undergrad, I actually uh, used art making or studio time as, as um, meditative uh, therapy for myself. Um, my father was really sick and I was young and I, I, it was just really overwhelming. Um, so the idea of like making, um, or even just thinking about making just the process of thinking it's, it's, a, it's having a conversation. It could be, you're having a conversation with yourself, but when you do that, um, a lot of people will talk about journaling, um, and how that, how important that is, um, but that even if you don't make a piece that's presented for the public to look at, that um, any form of conversation with yourself, I think um, is actually a really great thing about um, making whatever that making, whatever form it takes. Um, actually, um, the thing I, I thought about a lot about before um, uh, before um, meeting you guys on Zoom today, I I thought about when I was in graduate school. Um, I went to Cranbrook and I didn't I didn't really know what I was doing, um, but I I figured out at towards the end of my two years there that what I was interested in was was basically relationships human relationships. And I, I had something to say, and I, it's all really about communication. And I don't think that just applies to life. I think uh, uh, to art, you go through life, um, regardless of what kind of work you're doing to make a living, pay the bills. Um, I don't know if you're, you know, even if you're a trust fund kid, I don't know. You, it's all about relationships on a small scale, on a big scale. And you go through life, you have all these relationships. And we are constantly learning from each other, um, teaching one another. And I, I think, I think that's, that's something I figured out early on. That's sort of what's helped me. Okay. Um, I am going to maybe share my screen now. I just, I was, what we had think? someone had their hand up. Zoe, do you want to join okay. us? There we go. Hi, Zoe. Um, I had a question because it seems like a lot of your work revolves around um, 
this idea of human relationship and exploring that. Um, and I was wondering if working with an audience has ever led to any interesting or sort of unexpected effects. You know, do you go into your projects with sort of an expectation of how people are going to react or interact with it? Or do you just kind of go in and see what happens? Um, every single time there's a surprise. <laughs> it, um, I'm reminded of um, a talk that Jerry Salt did one time um, when I was in graduate school. And he, he said, uh, doing a studio visit is like, is like going on a date. Um, and doing these art projects, it's kind of like that as well. You, you can have an expectation of who this person is going to be like, but you have no idea. And you just don't know until you're there. Um, I did a project, it was 2008 in Kansas City, where I, I sat on a couch in the lobby of the Kemper Contemporary Art Museum for a month. Um, and I just hung out on the couch and I met all these people during that time. And what I, what I did was I was matchmaking and I had no idea who I was gonna run into. I met a lot of people, but also the people that I matched up, I didn't know what was gonna happen. I was like, okay, well, they're both looking thirst. You know, okay, go ahead, try it out. <laughs> and um, I got three, I hooked up three people, three couples. One, one couple wasn't really like a romantic couple, it was actually I got somebody a job interview. Um, but you just never know what's going to happen with people. So, so it, I can kind of set up things um, and hope things will turn out a certain way. But um, really, it's it, it's once 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 it's out there, it's completely out of my control. Thank you. Okay. We have one other person that's showing up and I'm just, you know, bringing people in Nancy so that mm -hmm. it can be conversational, which is mm -hmm. that good. Right, right. I think that's great. Okay. Hi. Lily. Hi, it's nice to meet you. Um, so I'm going to be really honest and admit that I'm not familiar with you, <laughs> um, but I really appreciate the offerings of these um, art lecture series, and I try to join as much as I can. And so I just quickly pulled you up because you're all over the internet, of course. <laughs> and um, the one thing that stood out to me was making connections and building relationships. Right, and um, I heard your story about the subway, and um, and I love the art of conversation. So I really like this um, format of like talking with you and having conversation about this experience and this situation because um, I am uh, always trying to learn more about um, connecting and relationship building. And um, I have recently attended a bystander intervention webinar and how to, how to navigate things like that situation you were in. And um, um, what's, there's some interesting elements to that to me. One is, uh, you know, trying to um, disassemble, if that's the right way to put it, um, our biases of people, we're always doing it. We're always assessing who somebody is. And, um, you know, I listened to your description of this person and they were large and loud and intimidating. And yet you still were really di direct in confronting them. But it seems to me like there has to be some sort of, there's something in the way that you did what you did that connected. Because in my mind, um, they 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 didn't attack you, and they actually passed you by. And to me, that speaks of connection. There was some sort of connection for that person that um, didn't see you as somebody to attack. And I, I don't know what that is, but um, 
I, I sometimes play with the idea that in confrontational situations to de-escalate whatever that person is coming at the situation with, like whatever it was for that person, I, you know, they could have gotten their Adidas outfit from a uh, um, free box because, you know, I've, I've shopped at free boxes and gotten really fancy stuff. So the bias thing in my mind, I'm like, I'm trying to, you know, break down what's happening with how people appear and how we break through to connect and communicate regardless of what they look like, right? What they're wearing or, um, but that's there. He was large and loud and um, we have to assess the situation we're in to somehow judge if we're gonna be okay. So, um, uh, you know, I think that is art. <laughs> I think there is an art to all of that, you know? So I'm just trying to um, formulate, I don't have a question really. I'm right, just, right. you know, um, putting this all together and wanting to have some sort of conversation about, I guess, what you think is happening there. Right. Uh, I mean, it's, I, you make me think about a lot of things, this bystander webinar thing that you went to. I, I attended one of those things too, because there was the whole thing with like Asian violence. And it's like, what can you do? And, you know, it reminds me of this old Oprah thing, what you're supposed to do if you get kidnapped, don't let them take you to the second site. You know, it's this crazy stuff where like, I don't know if you can actually apply these things in real life situation by situation, but you know, it's like, what, what can you do to prepare? I don't know, you imagine a scenario so that next time something happens, maybe you're kind of, you remember Oprah said, don't let them take you to the second location. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I, I don't know. I, it's, it's like when someone says, if you encountered a bear, like on a hike, you're supposed to make yourself really large and growl and then back up. I don't know that's going to work with every single bear, you know? So it's, I think like, this is one of these things that we can just go like this on. And we, everybody's different. I'm glad I'm alive <laughs> every day. <laughs> I just want to enter the conversation to ask the question, how does the, how do communities push past the authoritarian, authoritarian mentality uh, towards community advocacy in the sense of like, um, this needs to be like, you were just saying that Lily kind of like the idea of not repressive, but um, kind of repressive, kind of like, that's not good. So just avoidant, so maybe not authoritarian, just like kind of this avoidant behavior. Because if it is, it makes me think of Castaway, like the volleyball, um, what is that movie? I think it was Castaway where there was a volleyball. Wilson. 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 Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, it kind of makes me think of that, like when someone gets to this point where they have not had enough communication, maybe because they are, uh, I don't know, the ugly duckling or the, the you know, they're ostracized in some way. And so I, maybe that's not the case for the Adidas guy. Um, but I, I have this feeling that it has to do with like a lack of communication. And it's like, how do you, how do you create com communication and conversation with uh, people that aren't necessarily like picking up on social norms of like how, what is appropriate? Like I even had an experience to give an example. I had something similar kind of a little bit more violent though. Um, I was in San Diego and a man was, had a huge Bowie knife in his hand. Like I'm talking like, it was like this long. I don't, and he was just yelling obscene things across the parking lot to this woman. And I was maybe, I was coming out of the store and he was like, maybe 10 feet from my car, maybe 15, but I'm thinking closer to 10. And um, he was like holding the knife and yelling, you B word, you this. And it's a man yelling at a woman, a woman in the background yelling back. And I just started yelling. I was like, it's not worth it. I just kept repeating that to him. And he was like, it's not worth it. He's like, she's a blah, 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 blah. And I was like, it's just not worth it. I was like, it's just like, I just try to talk to him calmly, but very uh, confidently. Like you were saying, you were talking very like sternly, like this is what it is, um, hear me. 
but it was weird because everyone else in the complex, I was the only person even close to him. And that could have went really wrong. I'm not suggesting everyone go for that, that way of doing things, but there's just, everyone was standing around with their phones ready to call the police or holding up a camera. It was like, no one was there to really communicate with this guy. And it kind of makes me think back to that 9-11 idea. Like, how do we judge and gauge, um, like, when is it the time to step in and speak? It is such a, it is really a complex thing. Like, how, how do we break that cycle though and um, join people into the conversations? I think it's interesting. I think we were both, real, out, out Sandra and I were both really lucky in, in, in being able to interrupt or disrupt somebody's mania and um, and just walk away. Um, but yeah, you, you just never know when, how. Interesting. I have a follow-up question. Um, so when we're talking about art and we're talking about communication and connection, do you, do you, ha, have you reflected on what that, what happened? Like, was there a connection made with the subway guy? I'm going to avoid using his clothes as an identifier. Right. Subway guy. Okay. Yeah. Subway guy. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a strange thing, but, um, I, I don't know what it was, but I think the tone that I used was um, almost, it wasn't aggressive. It was almost like I was talking to a friend, you know, I was like, dude, you know, and, and I, and that's why he cracked a smile. He, nobody had talked to him until at that point. So he's, I don't know how many subway cars he's been doing this for, but I, I gave him the unexpected response. So it took him out of what he was doing, at least for that moment. And it, it was just the luck, it was just lucky. I mean, I don't know that I, I connected with him. What I did was interrupt whatever he was doing. And it might've gone differently if I was somebody who was also large and intimidating but I'm a pretty benign looking person. I'm, I'm five, six and, you know, I'm a woman, can't hurt anybody unless I really have to. <laughs> Thank you. I, I like this. Um, this idea of like, um, you know, we hear a lot um, the word community and we hear about community organizing, all, the, all this kind of stuff. But I think intuitively, um, I think we, I think it's a survival in instinct thing. I, it doesn't matter like your whole inner circle, it doesn't matter if it's just one person, but that's your community. I think we all have community and you can have multiple communities. And it's, I think it's, it's really great that we're throwing that word around. I hope it's not gonna, um, I don't know. I hope it doesn't turn into something bad, but um, I realize how important that is in, um, in me just being able to like be here, do what I'm doing. And it's, I feel I'm by myself, but I, in my God, but I felt like, I don't know why I thought, I thought if something bad happened, I'm, I was like, there's no way all these people are going to like not protect me because, <laughs> but you know, I, it, not too long ago, there's, there's always stuff in the media about like people watched as this person was getting raped or whatever. And, um, but I didn't feel that, but I have a trust um, in, in people. Um, it, whether I know them directly or not, I, I have a trust. And I think, I think that protects me. It protects us. Um, I think we're responsible for protecting one another. Uh, 
I'm going to jump in again. <laughs> um, so again, I, I think there is an art to, um, it's an energetic art, I think, that happens. Like when I hear you talk about how you did what you did and how you felt about doing it, um, you know, we often enemize people. I don't know if that's a real word, but right, we villainize people. And that creates a, um, a barrier between connecting with them. And I think when, when you know, you, like, you removed that barrier by, by talking to that person in a way that was like, hey, dude, right? Like you're a person. Um, I don't see you as the enemy. I mean, that's what that language I hear you saying you used. I just have to think that that's, that did it. You know, that, that, um, that if we can do that, I don't know, I'm also kind of thinking about things I've learned from Marshall Rosenberg in nonviolent communication, the uh, language of compassion. If we can get past the fear of the other or that we see them as the bad guy, that deconstructs the situation. And, uh, you know, I, um, anyway, yeah, I don't know if I'm formulating just what I'm experiencing and hearing the story and the situation, but I've been in volatile situations where it just feels like it could either escalate into something completely violent or it breaks down. And, it, you know, like you said, it didn't happen. I walked away without being harmed and we know harm happens all the time. So I don't know what, what is that ma you know, that magic formula where it, that, that doesn't happen. And I guess I'm just thinking of, you know, the violence that goes on in the world and how do we approach that um, on large scales and small scales. I mean, I think art is a way to um, reach across the divide and how do we live that, you know, how do we, because to me, that's a living piece of art, what happened. And that's why I'm, I'm really glad that we're talking about it because, you know, it's happening on campuses and, you know, in communities and things like that. So it's, I, I really appreciate the conversation. It's a great conversation. Um, thank you. I, I, again, like, I don't, I don't really know what happened. You know, we can speculate, um, but I, you know, I, I do think that art can be great on so many levels, but when it comes down to it, you know, if you're having a heart attack, you need a doctor, you don't need an artist. Um, so I, I don't wanna, I never wanna like elevate art to this thing that it can, and that, and there are enemies out there. There are some really, really evil people. <laughs> I'm not talking to them, no thank you. I. If I'm in a situation with people like that, I am extricating myself from there. No, it's like, it's, you know, it's, you gotta pick and choose your battles. The, what you're responsible is, is yourself and, and people that you care about around you, like get them and then run. There are bad people out there, they are bad. <laughs> I'm wondering, um, should, um, I actually had talked to Shaw before this about um, uh, maybe, I don't know if she wants to do it, sharing um, how we met. Are you feeling that or not? Sure. Just to take the conversation in another direction. All right. I mean, I think it adds to this conversation about, I think mm -hmm. that the, you start at the very beginning, which is to work on your instincts. Mm -hmm. And I think, I've often thought that the, to work on your instincts or hone your intuition or know what you're attracted to actually takes work to, to do that. That we, we can stuff our instincts and then we don't have access, access to them. So I think um, it takes a lot of attention on them. So um, how do you wanna start? 
Well, it's perfect timing because Scott just asked about the Somewhere in America project and how it works <laughs> and what it is. Um, I wonder, I mean, should we just go to the website or- Sure, do you want do me you to share? To share? Sure, that would be great. Yeah. So do you want me to start? If you would like, or I can do it. You start, you start. Um, okay, just just quickly, it's a um, project I launched. I don't even know what year it was, um, but I think Trump was still in office. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I started this project um, somewhere in America as a contest, um, and it was inviting people to tell me where they wanted to go within the United States. So I was concerned about what was going on in the country, or I guess it had been going on in the country for a really long time. But the media was, it was all, all the murders after murders of Black people in this country. It was something that was really upsetting me. And, and I've always want, wanted to learn about life um, firsthand, um, or at least secondhand. So I just wanted to go around the country and see what was happening. And so that was my impetus. But I invited people to tell me why they want to go somewhere in the country that they had never been before. And I got submissions and Shaw um, made a submission. She, she found out through a mutual friend of ours and, um, and she had an uh, amazing reason for wanting to go somewhere. And that's how we met. We went on a trip. And I think um, Shaw can show you the um, images from our, our trip. Mm -hmm. So the, the constraints of this were is you had to have a compelling reason to go to a place you'd never been before. So that was, that was and I had found um, a diary from a great, great grandmother from 1861 with pressed flowers in it. Um, and so, and put together that she was eight, or 16 and it was the first year of the civil war she was in union virginia at the time it was virginia and i didn't know anything about anything um and it opened up a sort of a world that i unknown i'd known but unknowingly known it was not conscious about a history of slavery with my ancestors having been enslavers and so and it was just in this diary where she practiced her signature and um, talked about the Yankees and um, and she had Union Virginia in there and her last name that she's practicing over and over. So that I'd never been there. I know nothing about any of it. So that was we decided to go pretty blindly. We went. Um, and I didn't know Nancy and Nancy and I got, went to Newark airport, rented a car and started driving and talking the whole time. Um, and so it was basically sort of two artists um, looking at something with, somebody had asked earlier in the chat about what's the difference between being there, you sort of subjectively experiencing something and having critical distance and this was a combination of that, both kind of very strange um, and personal and not personal at all and critical. So there was that combination of us looking at it through the lens of what is this, our relationship, looking at going to this place, um, which was union. Anything else you want to say, Nancy? Um, oh, there's this. I, I think the interesting thing is, as um, soon as I heard, um, I, I read why um, Shaw wanted to go, um, it be, like my objective as the person that in, invited this is, is my job is to facilitate her search. Um, and just do whatever is that I'm able to, to help. And it's amazing how life works. Um, we were hosted by an Airbnb host that was 
uh, in the area for a while. She worked um, at an art center and she put us in touch with people and places that gave us a shortcut to um, uncover a lot of the things that I think she was looking for. It was kind of exciting, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a very, yeah, it was really, and it was a lot of relational stuff. I don't, so this first picture turns out to have been that person who wrote the diary, their grandfather. And it was this big Greek revival plantation. It was bizarre. It was so crazy. And that we and the people that live there are these kind of oil barons who bought it, who weren't from the area and were obsessed with restoring it. And it's a lot of disconnect. I mean, I had no idea. I believe me, I've not inherited any of this. We there's not, I didn't grow up this way. So it was all like um many, many, many um, sort of steps of removal. And then, and it became not about my past particularly, but about these relationships we had. So with the Airbnb host, and then we went into um, the thing about the South is they have so many artifacts that they're not even preserved. They don't have like good art archives. They're just in these boxes with, you know, original um, documents of passes and ledgers and all kinds of things. So we, and we had relationships with um, the people we came in contact with um, asking questions um, about, I think for me, what was one of the driving um, questions had to do with um, how this impacted and people then and how it continues to live now and what's hidden. There's so much of it that's hidden. There's so much shame and there's so much denial. I mean, it really brought, what really came to life was the fact that our country has not come to terms with this particular history. So. Um, and this is the person we did find. This is the cemetery on the top. So that plantation house at the top was had a, a small slave cemetery behind it. And then on the other hill, this big grand kind of white cemetery. And this was, whoops, how did I do that? Um, this was the, we found the tombstone of this person who had written um, the diary. That's where Lynn worked, Carnegie Hall. I also felt that working with Nancy, in some ways um, we were your, I was your project and you were, I mean, it was really a, a kind of an amazing thing to start to just um, dig into this with another artist and I felt that you and I have we have different instincts like so when you say you know work from your instincts we were going into this territory that you didn't you just there was trying to dig things up like racial relationships from the past um, in a town that still it seems to be that it's right under the surface and it's and it was all kinds of complicated um, uh, relations to the area in terms of demographics, like how many people of African descent were in this area at, at, in the 20th century, at the beginning, the middle, the end, the Northern migration. And now that seems to be a migration back from the North to the South. Um, so all those things that were unearthing, they're tender. And uh, I felt that you and I had had really good complementary instincts. Sometimes one of us would be a little bit more shy or resonant, and then the other one would sort of push forward um, and yeah, and open up the conversation. I think, um, I think, I mean, it's a small town. There was a little downtown, but 
it's the kind of place where everybody knows everybody, right? Um, so we're obviously not from there, but I think the fact that um, there are two of us, it's, it was, I think it's easier for the two of us to actually talk to locals and for them to respond to us. Because when you, when you go somewhere with a friend, you're safe. You're not a weirdo. <laughs> so I, I, I think that helped us. Um, I, I know you went back with your mom later um, and I wish I could have gone, but I, um, but, but I think the trip was three days and two nights and it was pretty amazing what we were able to do in that time. And it was, be and part of it was like actually meeting people like at a bar, the local bar, talking to them and gleaning information that way. It's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, it, what, what, what what became clear to me is that if anyone has a question, you know, all all I had to do was lift a rock up. I always say, and then there, the crabs are there. Are tons of I mean, it was just every every direction was full of new things opening up rather than going in with a predetermined idea, having done research, caring about the genealogy. I had no idea that wasn't what this was about. It was much more about a question of experiencing this unknown um, and being open-ended about it, but how one door opens onto another door opens onto another door. And I just think that that is also part of what happens when you are doing, I think, you know, art often is asking just big questions. And, the, and, and when you ask the questions, you wait for the response, whether it's from the form or, or people or audience or, or just the actual materiality back and forth. That's, that's the thing that kind of leads you to the next stage and it teaches you back. So um, yeah, it was a very beautiful and difficult and um, yeah, long lasting trip. So I'm gonna stop it. Okay, I'm gonna, we have a hand up. Zoe, we want to come and join us. Hi, Ben Zoe. Hi. Um, I was really struck by um, the way you guys talked about sort of exploring connection through just meeting, going to this small town and, and meeting all of these people. Um, I've also felt very lucky in my life to be able to travel a lot around the United States, you know, take road trips all the time with my family. And it is incredible when you start to just sit down with people and have a conversation to see what happens. Um, and I was wondering, if this question's for both of you really, if you feel that you can create those same connections in a digital space, or if there's something about you know, being there physically, being in this this specific place and time and having that context that um, allows those connections to be made. Do you wanna go first? Well, um, I th no, I think you should go first because I don't think all that did for me to put it on there was to try to grapple with what I was contending with. I mean, just to try to be um, as honest and as, um, as ignorant and as I was and not, not no, I had no idea what I'm, I still don't know exactly what I'm looking for, um, but I definitely had conversations with both people, white and black, who, pose that question to me a lot um and some often with a little bit of uh suspicion but usually were behind me somehow I mean I think so for me that the putting it up there was was that was sort of um putting it together but in terms of on the digital that's that's for you um 
I, I think there are ways to connect with people dig digitally. I think there, are, again, we have our, uh, our like, you know, like instincts on, you can tell by the way somebody like, you know, writes a message to you, whether it's like a text or email or you're doing face-to-face, -face, you can tell and they're, whether they're sincere or not, I think. And I think there are, must be predators out there that can fake that. But I think a certain connection can happen digitally. Um, I think it's really helpful. Like, I mean, I've had friends who've had these like long distance relationships, like during the pandemic, like, you know, it, it facilitates that. But um, I, I love technology. I use what I need to when I need to, and then I forget about it. Like I've done like massive video editing and I'm like, I take lessons, I do it, and then I forget how to do it. I think um, it's all these things out there, they're tools for us and we can use them how we want to. But if you think about um, what happens in the world, there are actually like individuals that change the world. You know, they have a lot of people supporting them, they're lifting them up. But whether they're evil people or good people, it, um, when they actually, like Steve Jobs, when he had important phone calls or whatever, he didn't do phone calls. He met people and he walked with them and talked with them. Um, for me, there's, it's just another layer that's removed if you're in a physical space with someone. And I know like we've been able to bring attention to a lot of um, things, good and bad, um, through being connected digitally with everybody. But at the same time, to make change in our in real life, I think you actually have to open your door and leave. Um, I, it's one of those things I, I, I don't want to sound like an old person that's like, I don't want to have too much screen time. But it really makes me want to hurl sometimes because I can so easily get sucked into that like YouTube vortex. I'm like, oh my God, what is this? And I lost a genius friend of mine to online gaming for like 10 years. She was gone, okay? <laughs> I mean, it's really scary for me, but I think um, there are two different things. I, I think both things have like pluses and minuses, but I, I often wonder if it's like, you know, years down the road, they're gonna say, oh yeah, the internet, it's like smoking. <laughs> You know, I don't know. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> I guess we'll have to wait and see if that's <laughs> what they <Yeah>. say. <laughs> Thank you so much. Are you able to connect with a lot of people digitally? Do you do you get the same satisfaction? I don't. I actually, um, I've been sort of having this internal battle for like at least a year now of whether or not I even want to be on social media and be a part of it because I feel that um, it's oftentimes really performative for a lot of people. And that, it, like you said, it is a tool. It can be used as a tool for connection. And I see that as well. But I think that more often I see it used in a performative way. And that's sort of um, disappointing to me. Interesting. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Hello, um, my question's pretty different. Um, I guess hearing that you went to the South, that is something that like, as an artist, I've always wanted to do just in my own ancestry. Um, like on my mom's side, like all of my ancestors were enslaved. And so like digging into like, who am I? That's like always been like a big key of my work. But I guess my question is, for me, I'm always kind of afraid of how I'm gonna be perceived by the people I'm trying to interact with um, as a woman or as a person of color. And so I just wonder if you, either of you thought about that or had interactions where you like had to be like, oh, maybe this isn't, a space where I'm welcomed for whatever reason and how to like navigate that. Yeah, I mean, I think um, we had to deal with a lot of sort of, at first, at first, like when I, we went over to that huge house, those people were very excited, you know, about it, but they didn't like the questions we were asking. They didn't really like 
what we were interested in and what we were up to. Like um, they were still living in the bubble of thinking this was this, you know, incredible. In fact, the reason I went down with my mother the following year is they were going to have, you. they wanted to use the diary to do a civil war reenactment there. You know, like it was all over the top that way. So that was hard. And I would say the African-Americans that we met also at first were quite suspicious. I mean, the town was complicatedly segregated. The churches were still segregated. The cemeteries were segregated. Um, the people were, you know, light skinned so that, you know, there was a ton of European blood mix, you know, so it's all this stuff is, it's like just right under the surface painful, complicated, but, but when we went, like we went to this, we went to this Baptist church on for Sunday school and we were not really properly dressed and they welcomed us right in. And, um, you know, um, so there's, so it was, it's when you put your neck out, when you go and you are not, you don't have a big agenda, which we didn't, I think that also opens up um, some stuff, but it's prickly sometimes, you know. Nancy, I'm I'm gonna give the goofy answer. Um, huh? I don't know if you've heard of this like cheesy saying that says, um, "When you assume, it makes an ass out of you and me." So you can you can uh, you can lead with, "Oh, they might think this is me, this is me because this is not this." Um, I can say that about people, but um, then it's like, you know, who are you? I mean, you, you want to actually break those barriers, right? You want to, you don't want to be defined by your ancestry, really, or your gender or your, the way you look or the way you, you don't want to be, you want people to know you inside, right? And I think when you, when you take those things away and just approach someone, I think, I think when you're open and sincere, it's often really well received. Um, people, everybody wants to be acknowledged. And when you start a conversation with someone, you're acknowledging them. You're, you're, talk, you're saying, I wanna talk to you. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in you. I, I have something to say to you and I'm interested in, in hearing what you have to say to me. Um, that's like, that's the whole thing with, it's like, the, it's, it's this invitation. When you, when you invite that, for the most part, I think, I think for the most part, you, you will actually get good responses and occasionally you won't, but I don't think that's what should stop you from actually doing what you want to do. Yeah, do it. Thank yeah, you guys. Do it. <laughs> that was a great answer. Thank great. you. <laughs> Hi, Jacob. Oh, you're, oh, you're muted. I was going to talk about um, I was going to I was going to talk about um how how there there is this thing where people think the South is racist, and people have all these ideas about what racism means, and I think it it just like difference. It's like people being different and not being able to understand the difference. I don't know. I just wanted to talk about that. I, I, was... I, I, I feel you. <laughs> I feel you. It's not just the South either, too. There are differences right outside your front door. I don't care where you live. Um, people talk about how segregated New York City is where I live. You know, you see different people all the time, but people still live in little, little circles here and there. Um, the thing is, all these like differences that we're talking about, whether it's a racial difference, that stuff, it, it becomes invisible in just the two, three generations. I mean, I have relatives that are 10% this, 5% that, whatever. You can't tell that it's like, get rid of the, uh, it's like, I don't wanna be preachy, but it's like the thing that we all have in common is that we are born and we're people and we are we are on the same ball. Yeah, basically. we're all different. We're all different, but we have um, we have commonalities, and I think that's what we look for all the time. 
because because nobody knows what the hell we're doing here and this and you're just like sharing notes right like do you think this is what this is what do you think it is um <laughs> the way i face racism is mostly i faced it and i was just hang, hung out with like people who are black and and like at first they did they, they're not sure about me and then they are sure about me and then i say something racist and they're like oh that's fine because he's nice and then something else someone else comes up and says something racist and they're like why'd you say that that's horrible and it's just this this idea that people are don't understand when they can say things and when they can't say things well who's to police who exactly like who who can say what and who can't and it's it's like we can go in circles with this too. What are you hearing? They said this, but what are you hearing? And what are you taking from that? And is and that's about like, I don't know, there's different levels of communication. People have different communication styles. But I mean, I don't I don't know that I'm I know the way that I want to be, and I know the way that I want to be treated. And people who are not going to speak that language with me, I just move away, you know? And I, I can't, I don't have the energy to get upset about people who are going to, you know, when I, I, I immigrated to this country as a child and we moved around to a lot of parts. Um, I went to 15 different grade schools and I encountered racism everywhere. And, mm -hmm even the, the, you know, the partial acceptance of like, you know, where people are talking about like um, Chinese people, oh, but not you. And it's like, okay, whatever, I'm not Chinese, but whatever, not you, we're, we're not talking about you. I mean, everybody knows that stuff and that's everywhere. But why, why, why give your attention to that? Why do you want to interface with these people, right? Yeah. Why, why make that get you all worked up? Put your energy somewhere else where, right? I mean, life is really short. I, I wanna feel good. People with negative energy, I'm like, no, thank you. Push it away. I totally, I, I totally agree with you. It's just, I have met other people that they don't see, see it the same way. They say, well, I, I'm better, I'm different. I, I have this thing that they don't have. So I must er, be worth more or something. Um, can, I, can I say something? Sure. Can, can I say something? Yes, please. please. I think we are so confused about racism, racial prejudice, and racial discrimination. It's not just race, but gender, all of that. Uh, because we're not really doing what all of you are talking about, we're not coming from inside honestly we are so pc oriented and we have to really go beyond that so that racism is it's about institutional systemic discrimination on the basis of color or gender so we have to know that we're also complicated so lots of times the reason we are uh, unintentionally discriminating others because we are not aware of it. it's deep, deeply embedded in our unconscious. So it's a very, very complicated. But what I want to say is you are, your intention is not like that. Like uh, Nancy said, why do you care about the others? When your heart is genuine and that's what you're representing, we don't have to be scared. This is my area and it's very complicated, so I don't wanna take the time away, but we have to be really honest. We have to not react even though the others are reacting. It's not about uh, 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 putting somebody down. You're talking about, I am not this, I'm not that because our thinking is just so limited. We think in a dichotomous hierarchical way. So we have to work on there are appropriate dichotomous hierarchical way, but we have to look at it holistically as a whole person. The reason I was so moved by Nancy inviting those people uh, who are in shelter 
and then protecting their identity, just being there for them. That's the heart we have to have to deal with racism. So when you're frustrated because uh, you are discriminated, well, believe in yourself. Your intention is not that way. We can carry conversation, okay? I don't want to take all of your time away, so I'm just not going to say any more. No, I think that was great. That was so articulate. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was really great. We can all work together. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Great. Thanks, Jacob. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> that's what I'm trying to say. That's cool. Um, we have something in the chat here that um, I don't know if this person wants to come back on to answer, to talk about this, to address it. Oh, yeah, I just left some extra comments. Um, I guess the reason I brought that up is just because like you can experience violence and the like just bad things based on your identity and it goes a little beyond like just you know worrying about it or feeling uncomfortable in a space like I think that there are a lot of different people in the world that have to worry about being unsafe in a space and so I thought that it was a completely valid thing to bring up um whether or not like I mean, I'm not, I didn't mean to generalize and say like the entire South was racist, but there's a lot more like visual segregation there. Um, and I guess that was just based on my own viewpoint and I didn't want to speak to anyone else's, but so I just thought the conversation was kind of, I thought that I let it in a weird way, but I'm so, I'm sorry about that. No, no. I think we need to listen to those people who are really uh, traumatized by either race, gender, sexual orientation, disability, so forth, age. And we don't have to defend ourselves, but I think we, we have to have some place those people can really talk, talk about their traumatic experiences. No one needs to judge that, but we don't, provide the safe environment. Mm -hmm. And to be able to do that, like I said, we have to change um, dichotomous and hierarchical thinking. It is okay just to listen, say, uh, um, I am Korean. So somebody says, oh, Koreans are this way. And I don't agree with that. But if that person had a bad experience with one Korean, I need to listen to that. I don't have to defend that because I didn't do that. It's not about me. And I don't think we have that structure yet. We've got to have a being able to hear somebody else's experience as a valid because healing doesn't take place until we are able to grieve through our pain. So thank you for bringing that. Nancy, any last words? We're about to end. Wow. I Last words. Wow, it's cool. I didn't even get to share my personal photos. That's awesome. Um, I, I would say um, anybody who didn't actually uh, participate um, with audio, audio, visually, but we're just listening, that's participating in a different way. If you have um, an it, itch later to talk, I'm, I'm accessible after hours. <laughs> I'm always here. Um, and yeah, I'm public with my contact information. So um, yeah, I think that's all, all I would say. You? Um. I wish we'd seen your personal photos. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that it it's a it's a lot of um, construction, a lot of food, a lot of people, um, and it's just all mixed in. Um, but yeah. So I would just encourage everyone to look up Nancy's work and see if you can find her projects. They're all pretty great and. 
and wild ways that she orchestrates yeah. interactions. <laughs> um, and just thank you, Nancy, for coming. It's been lovely. Thank you very much. Um, it was, it gave me a lot of food for thought. I'll have to process. <laughs> Uh, applause from uh, applause to you guys thank you thank you <laughs>